It's time now for Perspective, and my guest today, Phyllis Omido, discovered back in 2009 that the battery recycling plant where she worked on the outskirts of Mombasa, Kenya, was poisoning the community with lead, including her infant son. Resisting her employer's pressure to stay silent, she quit her job and led an effort to get the plant shut down. Over 10 years later, in 2020, she won the community an unprecedented $12 million settlement. Omido founded the Center for Justice, Governance, and Environmental Activism and has received global recognition for her work, most recently being named one of the world's 100 most influential people by Time magazine. Phyllis Omido, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to speak with you. Could you start by telling us what happened back in 2009 when you began your job at Kenya Metal Refineries? How did you come to realize that you and others were being poisoned? Thank you, France24. It's an honor to be here again. Um, so um, my, my son started developing fevers um, at age two. He had been a healthy child before that and uh, suddenly started developing very high fevers, watery eyes, and he became very ill to a point where uh, he was hospitalized. But the doctors here in Kenya were unable to diagnose what, what he was suffering from because they were mostly testing for tropical diseases like malaria and typhoid and things like that. Uh, and so at a point where we had gotten desperate and he had been hospitalized because he had lost um, a lot of weight, he was having constant diarrhea, and he has, ha had lost a lot of uh, water also, he had to be put on a drip. Um, at that point, uh, someone from within government who was, who was a friend of mine, because I had worked um, within the, the business community for a long time. And uh, I knew these government officials because I worked closely with them. So they visited me in hospital, and one of them suggested that I test him for lead poisoning. And when I tested him, he turned uh, positive for lead poisoning. At that time, um, it was impossible to get a test for lead, for lead poisoning uh, in blood in Kenya. So we had to send his uh, blood to South Africa and wait for one week. And when his test results came back, he tested positive for lead poisoning at uh, 35 micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. At that time, WHO defined lead poisoning at 10 micrograms. Right now, it has been revised to 5 micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. The highest blood lead level now in Unohu is at 420 micrograms of deciliter of lead, which is about 800 times the WHO um, definition of lead poisoning. So that is uh, how I began and where we are, in short. And, and at that point, when you found out that your son had lead poisoning, uh, th there was a point when the company offered to, to pay the medical bills but didn't want you to speak any further about this. Is that right? And then how did you decide to, to turn this into a larger fight? Yes, I was actually given uh, documents to sign that I would not disclose anything that had happened within uh, the factory and what I had discovered. And um, they told me in exchange for the silence, they would, silence, they would pay the hospital bill because my son had uh, a very high hospital bill, uh, bill around $2,000 uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could not do that because I had, uh, even though I had worked uh, in, for a very short time, about three, three months, going on the fourth month, I'd worked for a very short period, but I had... Um, I had interacted with the community members in Oinohuru because it's only a wall that separated the smelter from the community in Oinohuru. And during my time there as, a, as a, um, an admin officer and community liaison, I had, I had talked with these people. I had gone, uh, visited them. Sometimes we used to eat lunch uh, that was cooked by people from that village. And therefore, it was impossible for me to just uh, keep silent knowing that these people are going to actually die in the long run. So I just made a conscious decision and, and uh, decided to go back to the community and go back to the, uh, my fellow workers that we were employed with. And I spoke to them. I told them what uh, my son, how my son had been affected and uh, how he had suffered and the risks that uh, they were facing. Many of them did not know at that time. Now, you won this landmark settlement for the community, but Kenya's environmental agency appealed the case. Where do things stand now? Have the victims seen any compensation? 
There has been no compensation so far. We uh, sued two non-state agencies and six state agencies. Um, the appeal has been done by two uh, state agencies. One is the Export Processing Zones Authority. This is a government agency that uh, actually goes, uh, is funded to go out of the country to bring in um, uh, investors. And they, are, they were charged with bringing in this uh, metal refinery. And they usually help them to set up and acquire licenses within the country. So that is one. The second one is the National Environmental Management Authority. This is the uh, state agency that is charged with uh, protecting the environment in Kenya, ensuring that the environment is not damaged. So these two have appealed, and they have, have appealed on the grounds that uh, they, they do not want to admit liability on what happened in, uh, in Onohuru. We have had so far four mentions in court. We are hoping to go for an appeal in January. So that is where the, the appeal cases will be had in January. So that is where we stand now. The victims are still suffering. We are still um, having so many of them who are suffering long-term effects of lead poisoning. Uh, many are suffering kidney failure and liver failure. The bills are too high because this is a community that lives on uh, less than a dollar a day. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a dire situation. And we are fighting tooth and nail. Um, uh, the state agencies, you know, have uh, lawyers paid by government, very top-notch lawyers. But we are very confident in the case that we put in court, um, and we are we believe that justice will will uh, will be achieved in the long run. And the neighborhood where this plant was located is a poor neighborhood. Are poorer areas disproportionately affected by pollution like this? Yes, actually, when I started my campaign. Um, when I started my campaign, I took this case to the Kenyan Senate and Kenyan Parliament, and uh, they formed a task force to look into this issue, uh, what they called uh, the Winomuru Task Force. And because of that task force, uh, the National Environmental Management was asked to go around the country and find similar plants. And the similarity for me, what was really striking is that all of these plants there were 17 plants in Kenya were shut down. Three of them that were located in Mombasa, others in the other counties in Kenya. All of them were, uh, were located in very similar neighborhoods. Neighborhoods uh, where there is uh, a lot of poverty, people who live on, you know, casual laborers and things like that. So it's, uh, it's quite unfortunate that uh, those of us who are the most vulnerable are the ones that are usually exposed to such um, activities. All right, Phyllis Omido, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, that was Phyllis Omido, uh, the environmental activist and whistleblower. Let's get a reminder now of today's headlines. Franco-American relations are back on the mend after a reportedly friendly phone call between the two leaders. France's ambassador will head back to Washington and Biden and Macron will meet next month to discuss the way forward. And the volcano on the Spanish island of La Palma continues to erupt. The slow-moving wall of lava has engulfed homes and sparked fears of dangerous gas emissions if it reaches the sea.